Great, thanks so much. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk today about primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. It sounds like you may have heard some of my punchlines, but uh, we'll go through them anyhow. So we know that primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma is really a unique entity um, that shares biologic features with classical Hodgkin lymphoma. It's a rare disease accounting for about 6% of all cases uh, of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And based on the old gene expression profiling uh, studies done earlier uh, in the 2000 uh, range, um, this data really shows that this is a unique disease compared to other subsets of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And in these plots, red being upregulated genes, uh, green being downregulated, you can see a very unique pattern. And several groups, including Margaret Shipp, uh, later showed that when you compared the gene expression profilings of primary mediastinal with Hodgkin lymphoma, there were actually significant uh, similarities. And we know that uh, clinically these diseases are also uh, related, and when you look at uh, histologically, there's sort of a spectrum from uh, nodular sclerosis, Hodgkin lymphoma, to primary mediastinal, with mediastinal gray zone being in between. This is a disease of younger adults with a median age of 35 uh, with a slight female predominance. Patients present often with extremely bulky disease, as they often do not become symptomatic until there is a significant burden of disease. The bone marrow is very rarely involved, and it does have a unique pattern of spread when it goes outside of the mediastinum and can involve other extranodal sites, including the kidneys or liver, and we often, uh, in patients with refractory disease, can even see involvement in the central nervous system. So prior to rituximab, there, uh, this is a table that shows uh, a number of second and third generation regimens, including things like MACOP B and VACOP. Each uh, many centers sort of had their own favorite recipe. Uh, there's the ACVBP regimen from France. And when you compare these regimens uh, to CHOP, specifically in primary mediastinal, there's a signal that uh, the more intensified regimens are, are actually more effective than CHOP. Uh, Top. Um, then along came rituximab, and this was the MINT study from Europe. Uh, this was a, an analysis of the patients with primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma treated on this study. There were just uh, over 40 patients in each arm, and you can see in the right-hand part of this uh, table here, this is CHOP or CHOP-like uh, versus CHOP or CHOP-like with rituximab. This complete remission rates were higher. About 60, uh, high 60s to 70 percent of these patients uh, received radiotherapy. And when you look at the event-free survival curves in the bottom left-hand side, you can see with the addition of rituximab, primary mediastinal went from being a disease which had a worse outcome compared to other subtypes of uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma to a significantly better uh, subtype. So when you look at the dotted line, that is the without rituximab uh, in the black line, and then uh, up above in the solid line is the improvement. So with uh, RCHOP, with or without RT, again, most of the patients received RT. About 80% of patients uh, were long-term uh, progression-free survival. So in terms of dose-adjusted REPOC, I'm sure everyone here knows this data. Uh, this is a, a regimen uh, that we are using as standard of care currently in this disease. Uh, it's, it can be given as an outpatient in some centers, but requires uh, continuous infusion of the doxorubicin, etoposide, and vincristine with rituximab on day one and cytoxan, so tumor cells are continuously exposed to chemotherapy. And then the dose adjustment uh, drives patients to be neutropenic to overcome differences in metabolism of the drugs. So uh, in terms of this study, which was performed at the NCI and took a number of years uh, to complete, there were 51 patients. Uh, this was published a couple of years ago in the New England Journal. It was a little bit uh, um, unconventional that they also included a retrospective cohort of patients treated sequentially at Stanford. That was uh, 16 patients. And I think that was to overcome uh, some criticism that, you know, maybe the sickest patients, patients with SVC syndrome or patients who are really ill are not going to get on a plane and be able to travel. You know, this is obviously uh, not only relevant for this particular trial, but for all of our um, you know, clinical trials in large cell lymphoma. But you can see this patient population 
in, um, uh, you know, about a third of patients had stage four disease and LDH was elevated in the majority of patients. So this really was you know, a fairly representative group of patients. And if you look at the event-free and overall survival data, you would say we've solved this problem. Uh, you know, 93% of patients were event-free in the NCI cohort, uh, and all of the patients from Stanford uh, did well with this regimen. Um, the end-of-treatment PET scan was really uh, interesting in this series, and we know that uh, you can see some inflammation, and I think anyone who treats this disease, you have to really be very cautious about interpreting the end-of-treatment PET. We will often re-image people who have some responding but residual uptake. And when they looked uh, at the NCI cohort in the 18 patients who had uh, uptake of greater than two, only those patients who were a Doville 5 or greater um, had disease uh, that uh, recurred. And you can see this, the specificity uh, of the PET scan and the positive predictive value um, are 54 and 17 percent, respectively. So uh, when you look at the addition of rituximab to uh, more intensified regimens across the board, um, it's a little bit less clear the impact of intensified regimens. I mean, I think we all see these patients who have chemorefractory disease and recur very early or progress on treatment. Um, it, this study, um, I'm sure you all know, uh, the Alliance study comparing RCHOP to dose-adjusted REPOC and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma was presented at ASH and showed no difference at all in, uh, in uh, event-free or overall survival. Um, you know, when we go and look at the subsets, the study was, uh, had pre-specified subgroup analysis according to uh, gene expression profiling. There are going to be a small number of patients who had primary mediastinal, so I don't think we're going to have the power to really answer the question, is RCHOP uh, equivalent to our EPOC in, in mediastinal lymphoma? This is really interesting work um, that uh, I'm going to talk about that was put together, uh, led by uh, Lisa Roth at Cornell. Uh, and in the pediatric uh, data, uh, this is one of the diseases that does worse than other subsets of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And there have been a number of trials using their intensified regimens. In pediatrics, they treat Burkitt's and diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma with similar intensified chemotherapy regimens and in general have extremely good outcomes. But you can see uh, some of the protocols here. Uh, the event-free survival for this disease uh, is on the order of 65 to 72 percent. And even when they looked at dose-adjusted REPOC in the multicenter setting, the event-free survival is 70 percent, uh, which looks low compared to what we would have expected in the adult setting. So based on this observation, uh, Lisa put together a multicenter study um, uh, of pediatric and adult centers looking at the real-world outcome of dose-adjusted REPOC. She collected 156 cases, the majority uh, of which were adult patients at 118. Um, and when looking at the baseline uh, characteristics, you can see, interestingly, that uh, the pediatric patients were more likely to have bulky disease at greater than 10 centimeters, which seems a little bit counterintuitive. Um, but otherwise, um, these were uh, well matched. And when you uh, here look at uh, how intensified, what was the, the level of dose escalation, you can see, again, not surprisingly, that the pediatric patients were able to go to higher dose levels, uh, with more than half of patients getting uh, to dose level four or higher. Otherwise, uh, this was similar. And when you look at the event-free and overall survival uh, for the entire cohort, it's about 86 percent. Um, although not statistically significant, when you compare the adult and pediatric groups, uh, there does appear to be a little bit of uh, a, a decrease in event-free survival in the younger patients. Um, the overall survival, however, uh, is not different. Uh, this paper is currently uh, in press at the British Journal of Hematology. Um, she also looked at the uh, end of treatment PET scan, and uh, similarly to what uh, was seen in the NCI paper, uh, the Doville 1, 2, and 3 do very well, and the Doville 5 clearly are, are the uh, patients who are uh, much more likely to develop recurrent disease. Um, in this series, the Doville 4s was a, a little bit less uh, favorable compared to what we saw in the NCI series. 
So I think where to go from here, you know, these, these results look really quite good, but we know that the biology of this disease is really very unique, which uh, lends itself to some interesting targeted novel approaches. We know that there is dysregulation of the uh, B cell receptor signaling, uh, which leads to upregulation of JAK and STAT, as well as uh, the proteasome, and kappa B is important in this disease. Um, this is probably the least uh, studied area. Um, the targetable surface markers, I think this is where we have some uh, recent data looking at brentuximab-vidotin. Um, when you look at CD30 expression in this disease, it is very common. Uh, it's not obviously as strong as you would see in uh, classical Hodgkin lymphoma. And then it's uh, uniformly CD19 positive as well, uh, which has led to uh, the use of CAR T cells, which I'll show in a moment. In addition, there have been a number of papers uh, looking at the biology of this disease uh, in terms of 9P amplification, uh, which is commonly seen, uh, which again leads to the upregulation of PDL1 and PDL2, leading to um, a very uh, clear uh, possibility of checkpoint inhibitors. So this, uh, I think, is worth pointing out. This was recently published as a letter in blood looking at brentuximavidotin as a single agent uh, in relapsed uh, primary mediastinal large B-cell lymphoma. This was intended uh, to be, I think, an 18-person uh, small study, but was closed early due to lack of efficacy. The drug was given uh, the standard single agent uh, administration. Um, 1.8 every uh, three weeks for up to 16 cycles. The overall response rate was very disappointing at 13% with uh, two patients uh, achieving a partial remission. Um, these were patients who were sick. Uh, they had a lot of disease and had been heavily pretreated. Um, but I think that uh, this is interesting and uh, will probably not move forward in any way. Uh, in contrast, pembrolizumab, uh, and we've seen this, you've seen this data already today. This was recently published in Blood. Uh, this was a small series of 17 patients, uh, and the overall response rate was 41 percent, uh, with about 12 uh, percent of patients achieving a complete remission. You can see the waterfall plot uh, to the right, uh, and the swimmers plot, and a number of these patients uh, have ongoing responses, and anecdotally, we've seen some patients who really are highly refractory, and if you look at table two, these are patients who've had stem cell transplants and radiation and really have very, very aggressive disease. So I think these responses are very encouraging. So in terms of CAR T cells, again, it, it sounds like there's been a lot of discussion of this today, which is not surprising. Uh, this is a very just approved uh, within the past two weeks uh, and is a very exciting modality for relapsed uh, large cell lymphoma. In this, uh, the ZUMA-1 study, there was a cohort combined of primary mediastinal and transformed follicular lymphoma. This is a um, very small number of patients with primary mediastinal lymphoma who've been treated thus far. Um, here are the characteristics. Again, these are patients who are um, highly pretreated and refractory to at least two prior regimens. Um, again, these are very small numbers, but when you look at uh, the overall and complete response rates, um, you know, there's a suggestion maybe in this arm that that may be a little bit higher than overall we see in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, about 40 percent of patients having durable complete remissions. So I think this, again, is going to be uh, something that we're going to be seeing a lot of moving forward and treating more patients to see if this holds up. Um, so in general, uh, you know, I think we have very good uh, outcomes with primary mediastinal large B cell lymphoma with dose-adjusted R epoch. Um, but when patients have primary refractory disease or, re or relapse, and this typically happens very early in the course of disease, this can be an extremely difficult disease to treat. Patients don't respond well to standard salvage chemotherapy. They often don't get to autologous stem cell transplant. In this setting, radiation can be very important, but again, we need for this subset of patients novel treatments. Um, and that's where pembrolizumab, I think, is going to be very exciting, and CAR T cells. And uh, now we are moving forward to look at can we add these uh, earlier in the course of disease. And uh, we are currently working on, uh, with the Alliance Committee and led by the Children's Oncology Group, uh, a combined study um, to look at adding pembrolizumab to upfront chemotherapy. And uh, tentatively, though, we have a ways to go before this is uh, approved by all the uh, 
councils at both, uh, both cooperative groups. We'd like to look at, you know, with pembrolizumab, could you actually use our CHOP uh, to sort of mitigate the toxicity that we see with dose-adjusted our EPOC? Uh, so more to come on that, and hopefully we'll see that soon.